Good morning, High Rock Malden. A pleasure to be with you once again this morning, and I want to wish everybody a happy Thanksgiving. And um, I'm sure many of you were uh, celebrating with family members, but others of you, it was a little different. And perhaps there was a sense of loss, maybe some sadness, maybe a lot of sadness. And I just wanna recognize that before we get started this morning and say that uh, I was praying for you. I was praying that in the midst of uh, your giving thanks and maybe experiencing some loss, I was asking that you would uh, be able to have comfort that comes from Christ. So let's begin this morning. And I want to begin with, with an image. Uh, and I want you to picture in your mind a happy place, a place where you were truly content, truly happy. You felt that total peace with the world. There's no anxiety, no fear, no pressure, you are completely at rest. And I want you to have that place in mind. And then I want you to think about another image, a harsher image, a, a stronger image uh, that reflects a reality uh, that we all know about, um, but we don't wanna talk about it. But it's one that I think we need to recognize, talk about, and I actually think that we would benefit if we lived into it. And the image is this. One day there will be a stone in our honor. And on that stone, our name will be engraved. And perhaps there'll be a meaningful quote, and there'll be two dates, beginning date and an ending date, separated by a dash. And that dash represents the story of our lives the narrative. And I want to ask, what will that story be? And can we consider if there is a grand theme, a grand narrative, an overarching story that helps us to make sense of all the mundane things we have to do in life? Is there a story that's overarching all other stories the pain, the happy, the celebration, the, celebra uh, the difficult times, the pressures, the anxieties, the fear. Is there something that helps us to make sense of all that? Is there a grand pursuit? I've attended uh, many funerals and have officiated at a good number of funerals, and uh, some tragic and some expected. But there's a theme that's always the same. People take stock of their lives. They think about what's really important. They consider it. Funerals are a great leveling of the, the playing field. And we think about what is truly important. And of course, with our COVID crisis, funerals aren't on a lot of people's minds. By the end of this year, there will probably three, be 300,000 deaths. And you multiply that by the numbers of people who have been sick and the family members and friends who have lost loved ones. It's devastating. I have a daughter who's a nurse and the stories she has come home with are tragic. Tear jerking, tragic. But in a lot of conversations I've had, uh, there's been some blessings. There's been some silver linings some things that people are thankful for. There's been an incredible puppy boom. Uh, families and households, uh, they, they rediscovered the outdoors. Droves of people are going to the woods. Families, households, they're playing games together. They're finding newfound unity with each other. But the other thing I'm hearing in people's conversations is a reorienting of life of taking life a little more seriously, of really taking stock, what really matters? What is really important? What do I really value? As for me, I'm 62 years old. Not sure how I got there, but I did. And um, I consider myself in the fourth quarter of life. Uh, hopefully I'm in the early part of the fourth quarter. Uh, 
my, my wife hopes, my dog hopes, my kids hope, my grandkids, and I even think maybe some of my friends hope that I'm early on in the fourth quarter. But nevertheless, it's the fourth quarter of life, and I want it to count. And so I have what I call a designer discipline, uh, something unique to me, a spiritual dif- discipline that's really just for me. And what I do is I, I imitate what some football teams do, especially at the collegiate or high school level, before the fourth quarter of their games. They raise their fingers in a four, fourth quarter, we're ready. And so I imitate that. So if you ever see me uh, walking down the street or in a field, and I'm walking like this with my four fingers up like this, um, yes, go ahead and think I'm a little weird. It's okay, no one's gonna argue. But I'm also doing something else. I'm praying. And I'm saying, Lord, help me to make this fourth quarter count. And what do I mean by make it count? I mean when I live a life that is fully committed to Jesus. My soul is satisfied. And it helps me and causes me to live a life dedicated to serving others. What I mean is this. When I live a life that's fully dedicated to Christ, my soul is so satisfied that I could give myself to others. And by soul, I I mean that immaterial part of us, uh, our mind, our emotions, our will, We could call it our affections, what we truly desire, what our immaterial self truly desires. And when I am fully committed to Christ, this immaterial self, my soul is satisfied. I cease striving. There's real freedom because I have what I need. I'm not grasping for more, uh, more time, more energy, more stuff, more room, more friends. I have what I need in Christ, and my soul is satisfied. And because my soul is satisfied, it helps me, it even causes me to give myself to serving others. But you know what? I get distracted. We held that image at the beginning of that place where we were perfectly content, really happy. That's what I'm talking about. That that inner self is just thrilled. It's real freedom. But I get distracted. I get overwhelmed by my day-to-day responsibilities, the ups and downs of life, the pressures, the anxiety, the fear, the mundane things that we just have to do in order to live, they, they could exert a downward pressure on us. And we could lose sight of what's really important. How can we live a fulfilled, satisfying life of singular devotion to our Lord Jesus? Can we be fully committed to him as the uh, great narrative of our lives? Can this story be the story that helps us to make sense of all the ups and downs, the fears, the anxieties, the disappointments, and the mundane activities that we do to hold our lives together? Have you considered what holds your life together? How do you make sense of everything that that you do? Is Is there something great to live for, something grand? Or more importantly, is there someone you look to Is there someone's advice that you seek for life-giving words, for direction, for wisdom? Jesus claims that his words are true, they're reliable, and that they will provide for us uh, uh, the satisfaction that our immaterial self longs for. And before we get into the scriptures, uh, I would like us to recognize something and maybe even admit something to ourselves. We want to be happy. I want to be happy. And I'm not talking about the superficial happiness that comes from a Saturday Night Live skit or a sitcom or a joke or a funny event. 
I'm talking about that abiding sense of peace, flourishing, happy, truly content, holding that image that I asked you to think about at the beginning this morning. Blaise Pascal, the 17th century mathematician, theologian, inventor, philosopher, put it this way. All men seek happiness. This is without exception. Whatever different means they employ, they all tend to this end. The cause of some going to war and of others avoiding it, it is the same desire in both, attended with different views. They will never take the least step but to this object. This is the motive of every action of every man. Now, there are acceptable ways to pursue this happiness and unacceptable ways. And um, so we live in pursuit of this happy life. Uh, I think Pascal is right. We are looking for happiness. We, we, we go to school. We apply for jobs. We take jobs. We change jobs. We move. We buy homes. We buy cars. We go on vacation. We get stuff. We have hobbies. We have children. We watch TV. We go out to eat. Why? because we want to be happy. We want our souls to be happy. We want to be satisfied. And I'm not saying at all that these things are bad. In fact, many of them are good. The problem is when we elevate them to a place in our lives where we expect them to do something for us that they were never designed to do and they cannot do. So we remain restless. The church father, Augustine, put it this way. You have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. And while oftentimes we seek to satisfy this restlessness through healthy means, sometimes we do it in unhealthy ways, ways that are not so socially acceptable. Sometimes our restlessness leads to negative behaviors. We drink too much. We take drugs. We look at things that we shouldn't look at. We pursue illicit lovers. We cheat on our taxes. We tell lies. We overwork. We accumulate possessions. Why? Why do we do these things? We want to be happy. And even when we know that these activities uh, will not provide lasting happiness, that in fact they could be destructive and self-shaming, we do it anyway because of that momentary experience of happiness. We long to feel soul satisfaction and we will fill our lives with things in order to find it. Is there a better way? Jesus says yes. And he invites us to a better life. I'll say it, the good life. And if Jesus is truly God, wouldn't there be a better way? Wouldn't there be a better life? Listen to these invitations that could all be found in the Bible. They pile up with promises of deep soul satisfaction that cannot be taken away. Pleasure that God provides and Jesus offers. Listen, Jesus says, follow me. Can you hear the call? Can you hear him crying out? Can you hear him reaching out to the crowds? Follow me. Come to me. Come to me all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. What a great promise this is. He's crying out to people who are weighted down. They're burdened. Worries, anxieties, fears, disappointments. What a promise. Jesus is beckoning. Come to me and I will give you soul satisfying rest. Jesus said, ask of me and I will give you living water. Whoever drinks the water that I give will never be thirsty again. Never thirsty again? This cannot be literal. What does he mean? He means that there's a soul desire that we have, an immaterial longing for satisfaction. And he's promising living water 
whereby we would never thirst again. These words from Jesus mean so much to me. And they've meant that for some 41 years. It's way back in the later 1970s, I was traveling around the country by myself and my soul was restless. I was hungering for something, something I didn't know what. I was thirsty for something. I don't, I don't know what it was, but I just wanted something more. And I was traveling around the country by myself. I know it was kind of a 70s thing, hitchhiking and camping and staying in youth hostels. And I had this whole outlook and philosophy of life, this sort of mixture of social activism and, and Eastern religion. Uh, and I wandered into this house called the Holy House. Place to stay, free meal. And the house father said to me, Joe, everything you believe is all fine and good, but you really need Jesus in your life. And when he said those words to me, it was as if he punched me in the stomach. I felt it physically. And a couple of days later, I confessed and said, Jesus, I want you to be in my life. And there were rivers of living water. My thirst was quenched. It hasn't always been easy. And to be honest, that sometimes it's been downright awful. But I know where to go for living water to get my soul refreshed and my soul satisfied. Here's another one. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall never hunger and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. It's the same thing. Never hunger, never thirst. Never ending soul satisfaction. What kind of crazy promise is this that Jesus is making for us? And then on the last day of one of the Jewish great feast days, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood up and cried out, if anyone thirst, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. This invitation does two things. It promises lasting soul satisfaction. But look at how it progresses. Those who respond will not only have spiritual life in themselves, but that spiritual life will flow out to others. Out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. In other words, I'm not just satisfied. There's an overflow from my life that brings refreshment and nourishment and help to others. How do I sum up these invitations? When I live a life fully committed to Jesus, my soul is satisfied and it helps me. It even causes me to live a life that is focused on promoting others. When we serve from this place of soul satisfaction, we're not trying to get anything anymore. We're not trying to earn anything for ourselves. Why? Because we already have it. We have this satisfaction. And so out of that, we give our lives to other and our motives become completely focused on the other. They're more pure because we're not grasping for anything. We have it already. And this is the kind of people that God makes us to be. He makes us to be people who thoroughly enjoy him and receive all the blessings from him so that we could live a life of doing good to others. Can you imagine what these verses mean to us? These verses mean life satisfaction beyond the external circumstances of our lives. How can we not respond to this invitation? but powerful voices call us to live a lesser life. Powerful voices beckon to us. We get deceived. We begin to think that other people could meet our needs completely. Fallen people, fallible people. We begin to think that they could provide for us things that they were never designed to provide. We begin to think that acquiring possession our accomplishments, that that's what will really satisfy us. But they can't. They won't. 
even when we know that the material possessions we acquire will either end up in the Goodwill store or the dump, we still reach out for them and ask them to do for us what they were never designed to do. We elevate them. And it's not that all these things are wrong, it's just that they're wrongly ordered. There's an expectation that they will do something for us that they cannot provide. Is there a better way? I hope so. Christian author C.S. Lewis describes the temptations and these beckoning voices we face. It would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures, fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. Jesus is the better way. When we live a life that is fully committed to him, he takes us on an outing to the beach. Our souls are satisfied. And from that place of satisfaction, we could live a life with serving others. If C.S. Lewis is correct that we are far too easily pleased, what does Jesus have to say about it? Well, his words help us. In this morning's passage, we, are, we read that Jesus is with his disciples up in the northern part of Israel uh, in the region of Caesarea Philippi. And Caesarea Philippi was a Greco-Roman city dedicated to the Roman ruler, Caesar. It was a place of temples, pagan temples, Greek temples, Roman temples. It was a place of idols. It was a place of debauchery. And this is where Jesus decided that his true identity would be revealed. It's in this place that Jesus has a conversation with his disciples. And in this conversation, there's a confession, there's a prediction, and then there's an invitation. And to understand the confession, we have to understand something about what was happening among the Jewish people at this time. They had endured 600 years of foreign rule. First the Babylonians, then the Persians, then the Greeks, then the Romans. They had had enough. They were looking for a savior. They were looking for a Messiah that would liberate them from foreign occupation. All that they knew was foreign taxes, oppressive taxes, occupying soldiers, no real freedom. And Jesus comes on the scene and they think, can this be it? Can he be the one that will reverse 600 years of foreign domination? So Jesus asked his disciples, uh, who do people say that I am? And the disciples respond, well, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah or one of the prophets. Now, who were these prophets? The prophets were men and women that called people back to God. In one sense, they were prosecuting attorneys, indicting Israel for their failure to love God with all their hearts and to worship foreign gods. And they also indicted Israel for their failure to provide justice for those who were oppressed and on the margins. So on one hand, they were prosecuting attorneys, indicting Israel, and on the other hand, they promised a better day, a day when a Messiah would come and he would right all wrongs and would establish in the earth a place of flourishing, a place of peace, when he would undo all that was wrong with life and there would be peace and justice in the earth and that opportunity to flourish with a better quality of life. I want to stop right there for a moment. And I want us to consider something. While the people did not understand exactly who Jesus was, they understood something. They understood that God was speaking through him. They heard God's voice in the words of Jesus. And in the midst of all the voices calling out to us, crying out to us, offering us fulfillment, let's listen for God's voice. Let his voice rise above everything else that we hear. Let's pay attention. 
The story continues. Jesus asked his disciples, uh, what about you? If the people are saying that um, Elijah or John the Baptist are one of the prophets, what about you? And Peter confesses, you're the Messiah. You are the one who will reverse all that is wrong in the earth. You will liberate our people and establish peace and justice in the world. This was a powerful confession to Jesus' true identity. But Peter's understanding was incomplete. He thought the Messiah would be a conquering savior a ruler, a, a one who ruled over a geographic spread, a political ruler, certainly not a suffering Messiah, certainly not one who would die. Uh, what good would that do? But Peter was wrong. Yes, the Messiah will ultimately right all wrongs, remove all pain and suffering and sorrow, and there will be justice in the earth so that all people might flourish but first, another kind of enemy needed to be quenched. Another kind of enemy needed to be defeated. The enemy within us. The enemy that is jealous and envious. The enemy that puts up barriers between us and other people. The enemy that looks down on people. The enemy of greed and disregard of others. The enemy of cold hearts. The enemy of bitterness. The enemy that thinks that accumulating possessions and power is the way to live. And the list goes on and on. The Bible calls this enemy sin. And through his death and resurrection, Jesus is defeating those enemies. Those enemies that frankly make us miserable. And they make the people around us miserable. And as they are defeated, our souls become more satisfied. There's a better quality of life and we're empowered to live our lives fully committed to Christ. Which means that this satisfaction leads to a serving and honoring of others. So Jesus clarifies what it means to be the Messiah. And he makes a prediction. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law. And then he must be killed and after three days rise again. Jesus says that he's going to suffer many things, not one thing, but many things, that he's going to be despised, he's going to be rejected, but he would rise again. And he makes this prediction so that when those things happen, and they did, he did suffer, he did die, right? He was rejected, he was crucified as a common criminal, and he rose again. Uh, he made that prediction so that when it happened, the disciples would know that it was God's plan all along. I want to just pause here for a second and ask a question. He was rejected. Can you imagine? Can you imagine that the one who offered living water, whereby we would never thirst again, true soul satisfaction, was rejected? He was turned over as a common criminal, rejecting what he promised, now, Peter, he wasn't buying this plan of suffering. He said, no, that isn't God's plan. And so he takes Jesus aside. And what we need to understand here is that in New Testament times, a rabbi or a teacher or a leader, uh, they walked in front of their disciples. And when they wanted to address their disciples, they would turn and speak to the, the disciples. But Peter wasn't having it. He was like, no, I'm coming up here. And Jesus, I need to have a word with you. And he takes Jesus aside. And he begins to rebuke Jesus. Peter thinks he knows better. Peter is acting like he's, Jesus is equal. That they're on par with each other. And he accuses Jesus. Can we not see ourselves in Peter's attitude, thinking that we know best, that we are Jesus' equal? See, while God calls us into a relationship, and it's a two-way relationship, and there's conversation that goes back and forth, and we can converse around complaints, disputes, and arguments, the directives 
the directives, the wisdom directives for how to live flow one way from God to us. So this relationship is a two-way thing where he talks to us and we talk to him. But the directives, the instruction comes back to us. One way from God to us. Now, Peter, we don't know exactly what he said, uh, but we know Jesus didn't like it. And listen to what Jesus says. Get behind me, Satan. You do not have in mind the things of God, but merely human concerns. You're just concerned about earthly stuff. You're not concerned about eternal stuff. You're not concerned about the things that really ultimately matter. What a blow. In this essence, he calls Peter Satan, get behind me. The way to providing the soul satisfying, satisfying life for multitudes is through rejection, crucifixion, and resurrection. Now the story continues. Jesus was going to live a life of suffering. He was changing the world, but not in the way that Peter expected. So Jesus calls the crowd and he instructs them, but more than instructs them, he invites them to live the life of a disciple. Listen to what he says. In calling the crowd, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Now this appears to be a hard word, but is it? I want you to see the invitation. I want you to hear the invitation. He calls the crowd, whoever will be my disciple. Whoever wants to be my disciple, this is a call to whoever. And before we see the sort of cost involved, see the invitation. And then put these words through sort of a cost-benefit analysis. And I think you will see that this is not a hard word. It's an invitational word to have life and have the life that comes from Christ. Now, when he says whoever wants to be my disciple, he is calling for a response. He's calling for us to do something. And are these, um, these words here, are they just nice ideas? Are they just sort of moral platitudes? Or is it a statement of truth, a statement of reality? These words are like the law of gravity. Whoever wants to save their life, they're going to lose it. Whoever loses their life for me and the gospel will save it. This is Jesus' words of truth. That preserving our life, seeking to protect our life, to build a fortress around our life, that's the way to lose it. But when we pick up our cross and deny ourselves, that's a way to find it. That's the way to have real life. Now, for us to understand what Jesus means by picking up our cross and denying ourselves, we have to understand what it meant for Jesus to pick up his cross. Jesus carried his cross so that sins could be forgiven. Jesus carried his cross so that the separation between us and God would be removed. Jesus carried his cross so that we could have a relationship with God. Jesus carried his cross so that we could have a new life. Jesus carried his cross to remove sin so that we would no longer be separated for others, from others. Jesus carried his cross so that the separation between us and God would be removed and that the separation between us and others would be removed Jesus carried his cross so that we might flourish and have life satisfaction. Now, when he tells us to pick up our cross, surely we can't do that. We can't accomplish that. So what does he mean when he tells us to deny ourselves and pick up our cross? The essence of what Jesus did by picking up his cross 
was he was in a saying, in effect, God, I trust you to meet my needs. When I lay down my life, you will provide resurrection. And because I trust you to meet my needs, I will give my life as an offering for the world. When we deny ourselves and pick up our cross, we are saying, God, I trust you to meet my need. I trust you to meet my, meet my need for energy, for wisdom, for love. Whatever it is that I need, I trust that you will meet that need so that I could live a life of serving others. Or saying it simply, when we live a life that is fully committed to Jesus, our soul was satisfied because our immaterial needs are met. And out of that life, we could live a life serving others. So the question comes down to us. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet forfeit their soul? When Jesus asks a question, he's not looking for information. What good is it? What good is it for to pile up accomplishments and possessions and yet forfeit our soul? What do we really want to gain in life? What are we really after? What are we ultimately after in life? When I come to Jesus in prayer, I'm seeking something. I'm seeking soul satisfaction. I'm seeking power to love my wife as Christ loves the church. I'm seeking water that satisfies my soul. I'm seeking strength to forgive others. I want wisdom to not let petty offenses bother me. I want to love so I, uh, so I could love others as Jesus loved me. I want this so that I could be Jesus' hands and feet in the world. Lord, make it so. Now, practically, what does this mean? Number one, seek Christian community. We learn in Christian community. We learn through uh, community worship. We learn through Bible studies. We learn through prayer meetings. We learn through uh, conversations. And it's also uh, through the church and in the church that we have a lot of opportunities uh, to serve. And if you are interested in serving more at High Rock Malden, I just encourage you to email at info at highrockmalden.org. And uh, you could get more information about opportunities to serve, particularly the city of Malden. In addition to seeking Christian community, secondly, and there's no substitute for this, get to know Jesus by reading about him. We have a book, the Bible. The Bible is divided into two parts. There's an Old Testament and there's a New Testament. At the beginning of the New Testament, there are four books about Jesus, the four Gospels. Gospel just means good news. I want to encourage you to not always just depend on other people to tell you about Jesus, but mine some gold for yourself. Go and learn for yourself. And you could begin by uh, reading in the Gospel of John. And I think you would find that an encouragement uh, to yourself. And even if you find things confusing, just press on and just say, Jesus, satisfy the longing of my soul. Teach me about your life. Teach me more. I want to know more about you. Thirdly, make a decision. Is he who he says he is? He's the Messiah. If the answer is yes, confess it. Maybe you've confessed it before. Maybe you've confessed it a hundred times before. Maybe you've never confessed it before. Today's the day. Jesus, you are my Messiah. You are the Savior, the one who provides living water. Fourthly, open yourself up to correction. And as we read the Bible, as we read about Jesus in the New Testament, and we read the great story of God throughout the whole Bible, uh, it will be like a mirror. It will reveal faults in our lives. It will reveal uh, blemishes. It will reveal areas where there are gaps between God's standards and our standards. Open yourself up to that correction. Ask for his forgiveness and ask for Jesus to change you. And finally, receive the blessings. Drink in the blessings. When he says you shall never thirst, drink that in. 
When he says that he'll forgive your sins, receive it. When he says that you might have come, that he came, that you might have life and have it to the fullest measure, take that. When he says that he's the resurrection and the life, whoever believes in him will never die, own that. When he says out of your innermost being will flow rivers of living water, accept it. Know that you will be a blessing to others. Let's pray together. And I want to give you opportunity right now to say yes. I want to give you opportunity to say yes right now to Jesus. Maybe, maybe you've said it a hundred times. Maybe you've never said it before. But right now, would you say, yes, Jesus, you are my Messiah. You are my Savior. I hear you calling. I hear you saying, follow me. And this morning, Lord, I am saying, yes, Lord, I want to follow you. I give my life to you. Give me the living water whereby I will never thirst again. I confess that I have been restless. My soul has been restless. Please give me rest. Please satisfy the deepest longings of my soul. I'm asking you, Lord. And Lord God, I pray for this congregation and for everyone in it that you would meet their deepest immaterial needs. And I pray that they would drink the living water and that out of their innermost being will flow rivers of living water. And that each person in this congregation would be a blessing to many. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.